you probably realize that water is essential to living things, but what you might not realize is how little of it that humans have to use. Um, even though the surface of the earth, about two-thirds of it, is covered with water, most of that is in the oceans. And only a little less than 3% uh, of that is fresh water available for use by humans. Um, about a quarter of that fresh water is underground, and the rest being above ground, most of the uh, above ground water is frozen and locked up as ice in glaciers and in the polar regions. Um, this leaves surface waters, like lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, and actually water in the atmosphere counts as well. So let's talk about uh, groundwater first, and let me back up for one second. When we talk about the main repositories for fresh water, we're going to talk about three areas, and those three areas are groundwater, surface waters, and in the atmosphere. So we'll address each of those one at a time. So back here, we're going to start with groundwater and a few definitions. Um, groundwater is water that percolates down through the soil and into permeable rock, which is porous. So we call uh, this region here an aquifer, so small spaces found within permeable layers of rock and sediment where water is sitting. That's what we call an aquifer. The top of the aquifer is what we call the water table. Um, it's a term you'll hear often when people are drilling wells. How far down did you have to drill before you hit the water table? And then they continue certainly beyond that. Um, there's two kinds of aquifers. An unconf unconfined aquifer is basically porous rock covered by soil. And it's unconfined, meaning water can more easily enter it. Um, and then you have a confined aquifer. And a confined aquifer is an aquifer su surrounded by a layer of impermeable rock or clay on each side. So you can see it's easier, or it's uh, more difficult for water to enter and leave this type of aquifer. This brings us to another term um, called recharge. And recharge is how water percolates down through the soil into the aquifer. And the area over which it does this is called the recharge zone. So the recharge zone for this unconfined aquifer is going to cover this entire area. Even though, say, over here it's not directly above the aquifer, the water is still going to percolate down into there. The confined aquifer has a much smaller recharge zone. There we go. And it brings us to one last term for uh, groundwater, and that's a spring. Um, essentially, an aquifer that naturally percolates up to the surface, that's a spring. It's nothing more than that. While we're on the topic of groundwater, probably a good time to talk to you about the Ogallala um, Aquifer. And this is the aquifer that you've heard about maybe with the whole Keystone XL pipeline, um, that the pipeline would be going over this. And this is the largest fresh, uh, largest groundwater aquifer, well, I guess groundwater and aquifer are saying the same thing, aren't they? Um, one of the largest sources of fresh water in the United States and certainly the largest aquifer. Um, let me pause. A lot of after school announcements today. At any rate, I want to take a look at this aquifer and how much it's been used. Um, this area of the country being an area that is known for growing crops and it's an intensive water um, use practice. We'll talk more about that later in this chapter. But we want to talk about the water levels here um, and in this aquifer and the changes since 1950. So that's what this first illustration shows is the changes in depth of the aquifer since 1950. And the water levels, the darker the color of red, um, the more it's been depleted. So the water levels have dropped quite a bit in these areas where we have greater concentrations of people or greater populations. Please meet your ride in the and it's time for me to do a public service announcement. If you're riding with someone after school or your parents are picking you up, please have them text you rather than asking the office to do an all call. Uh, I'm kidding, it's okay. Um, but when you compare this drop in 45 meters in some areas <clears throat> since 1950, um, some areas it's less than 60 meters deep right now in these lightish blue areas, which is most of the aquifer. So if we continue to consume water at the rates that we have and it doesn't recharge um, at the rate that we're withdrawing water from it or greater, that water, that aquifer is going to be depleted. So yes, aquifers do recharge, 
but if we're using up the water faster than it can be replaced in the aquifer, that's when we run into some complications. All right, so this brings us to a little discussion of depleting aquifers. Uh, under normal and more sustainable conditions, remember the water table is the top of the aquifer. So under normal conditions, deep wells, as long as water is not being drawn out of the aquifer um, faster than it's being recharged due to rainfall percolating down through the porous rock and soil, um, then no problem, water table stays at about the same height. However, if there's a deep well um, with rapid pumping and water's being taken out faster than the recharge, the recharge process is occurring, it can draw the water table down significantly and that can affect surrounding wells. So we call this area here where it's uh, drawing down the water table in this cone shape, a cone of depression um, that's depleting the water. And as you can see, these neighboring wells run dry. And that's something to think about where we live, where most people are on groundwater. During a drought, people don't feel they necessarily need to conserve water if they're using groundwater or have a well. But in fact, you do. Um, you may not be withdrawing as much water as, say, an agricultural practice like a farm. However, your neighbor's wells may not be drilled as deep as yours, and you can lower the water table, especially in periods of prolonged drought. So let's, let's uh, take a look at coastal areas. And uh, under normal conditions in coastal areas, you have fresh water underground, and as long as that water table say, stays relatively high, um, there's going to be significant water pressure here, and that's going to be keeping the salt water out. Um, and things work well, and if, as long as there are relatively few wells in this area and we're not depleting the aquifer, then it's not really a big deal. But when many wells, wells get drilled and the aquifer begins to be depleted, then the water table lowers, and this reduces the water pressure here in the aquifer. That allows salt water nearby to move in, and that's going to contaminate these wells uh, with salt, making them salt water and unusable by humans. This process is called a saltwater intrusion. I almost forgot to tell you what I was talking about. The one point that I do want to talk about um, with surface waters, we just covered ground waters, now we're going to go on to surface waters, um, it has to do with eutrophication and nutrient levels in lakes. Um, lakes are classified based on how much primary production is going on in them. And usually this is the natural life cycle of a lake over time. And when this progression occurs naturally, it takes centuries. When humans influence, it, it, this progression can happen in a matter of decades. Um, so within, with an oligotrophic lake, um, this is a lake that's pretty clear. Not a lot of sediment on the bottom and very clear water or very little turbidity as we've talked about when we've tested the water on our campus is a lot of times an indication of very few nutrients in the water. Um, mesotrophic lakes are lakes uh, that have a fair amount of sediment on the bottom and also they're going to have a fair amount of dissolved solids within them and uh, they're going to have a lot of production um, but they're going to have a lot of they're going to be more nutrient rich and these are nutrients that are going to run into the lake due to runoff over time same thing with the sediment. Um, a eutrophic lake, this is the last stage um, is one in which there's a lot of sediment on the bottom and a lot of times this happens due to runoff and where there's human development that's going to happen a lot faster but also you're going to have more dissolved solids within it you're going to have higher levels of nutrients within it and those levels of nutrients are going to lead to more plant growth and in some cases you'll get algal blooms on the top um, and the algal blooms will lead to a condition um, known as eutrophication where, and we'll get into this in a little while, um, actually in the next chapter coming up, or this can actually be a bad thing. You would think a lot of production would be a good thing, but actually, as you get algal blooms, the, al the algae start to die off. As the algae start to die off, the decomposers start using up all the oxygen and lowering the oxygen levels within the pond, and uh, that can lead to fish kills. So we'll sh I'll show you some pictures in upcoming chapters um, when our ponds on campus were artificially eutrophic and how they've improved today. So the idea here, um, as we go from oligotrophic to mesotrophic and eutrophic, amount of sediment increases over time, and the amount of nutrients in the water increases over time. This can happen naturally, 
taking a long time or it can happen culturally or due to humans over decades. One last thing. I want to talk about atmospheric water very, very briefly. Um, water in the atmosphere is very important to global distribution of water. And the one thing that I want you to watch is the Dust Bowl video. And that can be found on our class page. So please make sure you go and watch that because that directly relates to atmospheric water. And it's also an event from U.S. history that it's important for you to know a little bit about. So as always, please ask questions online or in class. And I'll see you next time.